Hello and welcome to United States History 11, and this is the seventh in our series of lectures dealing with United States history from the pre-colonial time to 1877. So, today we are talking about the era of good feelings. The most impressive byproduct of the War of 1812 was a heightened nationalism the spirit of nation consciousness or national oneness. America may not have fought the war as one nation, but it emerged as one nation. So exhilarating was the post-war era that President Madison, despite his blunders, enjoyed the unusual distinction of being more popular when he left the White House in 1817 than when he entered it in 1809. A weak nationalism had existed since revolutionary days, but the vibrant new nationalism was composed of many additional ingredients. It sprang partly from pride in recent victories, partly from the setback to federalist sectionalism and states' rightism, partly from a lessening of economic and political dependence on Europe, and partly from confidence in the future. Swelling numbers of citizens, although probably not yet a majority, were coming to regard themselves first as Americans, and secondly, as citizens of their respective states. The changed mood even manifested itself in the birth of a distinctively national literature. Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper attained international recognition in the 1820s. Significantly, as the nation's first writers of importance to use American scenes and themes. School textbooks, often British in an earlier era, were now being written by Americans for Americans. Even American painters increasingly celebrated the glories of American landscapes on their canvases. A fresh nationalistic spirit could be recognized in many other areas. A larger, more beautiful national capital began to rise from the ashes of Washington. The army was expanded to 10,000 men. The navy further covered itself with glory in 1815 when it administered a thorough beating to the uh, pirate plunderers of North Africa. These gratifying victories, inspired by the spirit of nationalism, further inflamed nationalism. Stephen Decatur, naval hero of the War of 1812 and the North African expeditions, pungently captured the nationalistic mood in a famous toast made on his return from these Mediterranean triumphs. As he is quoted as saying, Our country, in her intercourse with foreign nations, may she always be in the right. But our country, right or wrong. A rising tide of national consciousness also touched finance. The War of 1812 had demonstrated the folly of permitting the Bank of the United States to expire in 1811, on the very eve of hostilities. Weak state banks responding to the vacuum had seemingly sprung up beside every village tavern. The country was flooded with depreciated banknotes that, incidentally, had hampered the war effort. A revived Bank of the United States, in response to these obvious needs, was voted by Congress in 1816. It was modeled on the first one, but had a total capital of some $35 million, three and a half times that of the original. Jefferson Republicans taught a bitter lesson during the war, supporting the revived institution. In fact, they cleverly, but inconsistently, narrowed the same arguments for a bank that Hamilton had used against Jefferson back in 1791. 
The Federalist minority in Congress, opposing the Republican measures with its dying gasps, no less inconsistently denounced the Federalist Spond Bank as being unconstitutional. They refer to it as the moneyed monster. Nationalism also manifested itself in manufacturing. Patriotic Americans took pride in the factories that had recently mushroomed forth largely as a result of the self-imposed embargoes and the war. When hostilities ended in 1815, British competitors undertook to recover lost ground. They began to dump the contents of their bulging warehouses on the United States often cutting their prices below cost in an effort to strangle the American war baby factories in the cradle. The infant industries bowled lustily for protection. To many red-blooded Americans, it seemed as though the British, having failed on the battlefield to crush American fighters, were now seeking to crush American factories. A Nationalist Congress, out-federalizing the old Federalists, responded by passing the path-breaking tariff of 1816. The legislators were impressed with the desirability of saving the new industries for the national defense, while at the same time promoting the general welfare. The tariff of 1816 significantly was the first in American history with aims that were primarily protective. Its rates, roughly 20 to 25 percent on the value of imported goods, were not high enough to provide completely adequate safeguards, but the law was a bold beginning, a strongly protective trend that started and stimulated the appetites of the protected for even more protection. The battle in Congress over the Tariff of 1816 reflected north-south sectional cross-currents. 34-year-old Representative John C. Calhoun of South Carolina played a stellar role in the debates. A recent war hawk and an ardent nationalist, he supported the tariff bill with all his eloquence and vigor. In 1816, there was some likelihood that the destiny of his native South lay in manufacturing, as well as in the intensive cultivation of cotton. But within a few years, Calhoun became a relentless foe of a highly protective tariff. He sadly concluded that it was being used to enrich a few Yankee manufacturers rather than to build up the economic self-sufficiency and well-being of the entire nation. Calhoun encountered a worthy adversary in Daniel Webster of New Hampshire, also 34 years of age. Black Dan, as he was sometimes referred to, uh, because of his dark black hair, eloquently opposed the highly protective duties of the tariff of 1816. He took his stand, even though he was later to be a zealous nationalist and an ardent champion of high protection. The explanation is simple. Manufacturing in New England had not yet pushed shipping into a backseat position and the shippers of Webster's New Hampshire district feared that a tariff would interfere with their trade. New England, though favoring some protection, was not yet completely willing to exchange trading with manufacturing. Nationalism was further highlighted by a grandiose plan of Henry Clay for developing a profitable home market still radiating the nationalism of war hawk days he threw himself behind an elaborate scheme known by 1824 as the american system this system began with the protective tariff behind which eastern manufacturing would flourish 
Revenues gushing from the tariff would provide funds for roads and canals, especially in the fast-developing Ohio Valley. Through these, new arteries of transportation would flow foodstuffs and raw materials from the south and west to the north and east. In exchange, a stream of manufactured goods would flow in the return direction. Persistent and eloquent demands by Henry Clay and others for international improvements struck a responsive chord with the public. The recent attempts to invade Canada had all failed, partly because of oath-provoking roads, or no roads at all. People who have dug wagons out of deep mud do not quickly forget their blisters or their backaches. An outcry for better transportation, rising most noisily in the road-poor West, was one of the most striking aspects of the nationalism inspired by the War of 1812. But attempts to secure federal funding for roads and canals stumbled on Republican constitutional scruples. Congress passed Calhoun's bonus bill in 1817, which would have parceled out a million and a half dollars to the states for internal improvements. But President Madison sternly vetoed this handout measure as unconstitutional. Madison's successor, James Monroe, generally followed the same line of negative reasoning. The individual states were thus forced to venture ahead with construction programs of their own, including construction of the Erie Canal, triumphantly completed by the state of New York in 1825. Jeffersonian Republicans, who had gulped down Hamiltonian constructionism on other important problems, choked on the idea of direct federal support of interstate internal improvements. The enfeebled Federalists, now turncoat strict constructionists, could grudgingly applaud the vetoes of the Jeffersonian Republican presidents. New England, in particular, strongly opposed federally constructed roads and canals because such outlets would further drain away population and create competing states beyond the mountains. James Monroe was nominated for the presidency in 1816 by the Republicans. He, too, was another Virginian, just like Washington, Jefferson, and Madison before him. The Federalists ran a candidate for the last time in their history, and were crushed rather soundly. The death of the once proud Federalist Party was due to various diseases, shortcomings, and misfortunes. The list would include its disgraceful war record, its inability to choke down the new nationalistic program, and the theft of its tenants by the Jeffersonians. Many Federalists followed their stolen principles into the opposition camp. Others gradually crawled away to the political graveyard. The irony is that the original Hamiltonians, while the party of the Inns, had been conspicuously nationalistic. Now, as the party of the Outs, they scorned the nationalism of the Republicans. In James Monroe, the man and the times auspiciously met. He straddled two generations, the bygone age of the Founding Fathers and the emergent age of nationalism. Never brilliant and perhaps not great, the serene Virginian was in intellect and personal force the least distinguished of the first eight presidents. But the times called for sober administration, not heroics, and Monroe was an experienced, level-headed executive, 
with an ear to the ground talent for interpreting popular rumblings. Emerging nationalism was further cemented by a goodwill tour that Monroe undertook early in 1817, ostensibly to inspect military defenses. He pushed northward deep into New England and then westward to Detroit, viewing en route the Niagara Falls. Even in Federalist New England, he received a heartwarming welcome. A Boston newspaper was so carried away with it that it printed the now famous phrase that there was an era of good feelings that had been ushered in along with the president. This happy phrase since then has been commonly used to describe the administrations of Monroe. The era of good feelings, unfortunately, was something of a misnomer. Considerable tranquility and prosperity did, in fact, smile upon the early years of Monroe, but the period was a troubled one. The acute issues of the tariff, the bank, internal improvements, and the sale of public lands were being hotly contested. Sectionalism was crystallizing, and the f conflict over slavery was beginning to raise its hideous head. A vanquished Federalist party was breathing its dying gasps, leaving the field to the triumphant Republicans and one-party rule. But where there is only one party, or where one of the parties enjoys a lopsided majority, the tendency is for factions to develop and fight amongst themselves. By the early 1820s, an era of inflamed feelings was dawning. Political giants, men like Clay, Calhoun, Jackson, and John Quincy Adams, elbowed for power and aggressively promoted the clashing economic interests of the respective sections. Much of the goodness went out of the good feelings in 1819, when a paralyzing economic panic descended. It brought deflation, depression, bankruptcies, bank failures, unemployment, soup kitchens, and overcrowded pest houses known as debtors' prisons. This was the first national financial panic since President Washington had taken office. It was to be followed by a succession of others about every twenty years or so, in what seemed to be an inevitable cycle. Many factors contributed to the catastrophe of 1819, but looming large was over-speculation in frontier lands. The Bank of the United States, through its western branches, had become deeply involved in this popular type of outdoor gambling. Financial paralysis from the panic, which lasted in some degree for several years, gave a rude setback to the nationalistic ardor. Various parts of the country tended to drift back toward the old sectionalism, as they concentrated on bailing themselves out. The West was especially hard hit. When the pinch came, the Bank of the United States forced the speculative Western banks to the wall and foreclosed mortgages on countless farms. All this was technically legal, but politically unwise. In the eyes of the Western debtor, the bank soon became a kind of financial devil. A more welcome child of the panic was fresh legislation to govern the sale of public lands. The plight of the Western farmer, combined with the evils of land speculation, laid bare the defects of the Land Act of 1800, as amended in 1804. By its terms, the pioneer could buy a minimum of 160 acres at $2 an acre over a period of four years, with a down payment of $80. When hard times came, entire communities would default on their installments. An improved Land Act of 1820 
lightened the burden somewhat. It permitted the buyer to secure 80 virgin acres at a minimum of $1.25 an acre in cash for a total cost of $100. There was less acreage, but less monetary outlay. The Panic of 1819 also created backwashes in the political and social world. It hit especially hard at the poorer classes and hence helped cultivate the seedbed of Jacksonian democracy. It also directed attention to the inhumanity of imprisoning debtors. In extreme cases, often overplayed, mothers were torn from their infants for owing a few dollars. Mounting agitation against imprisonment for debt bore fruit in remedial legislation in an increasing number of states. Beyond doubt, the West, out of which had swooped the war hawks of 1812, was by far the most nationalistic of the sections. Being new, it had no long established states' rights tradition. Moreover, it had early learned to lean on the national government, from which it had secured most of its lands, directly or indirectly. It was a mixing bowl within the huge American melting pot for people from all the sections of the nation. Marvelous indeed had been the onward march of the West. Nine frontier states had joined the original 13 between 1791 and 1819. With an eye to preserving the north-south sectional balance, most of these had been admitted alternately uh, between free and slave. Why this explosive expansion? In part, it was simply a continuation of the generations-old westward movement, which had been going on since early colonial days. In addition, the siren call of cheap land had a special appeal to European immigrants. Quaintly garbed newcomers from abroad were beginning to shuffle down the gangplanks in impressive numbers, especially after the war of embargoes and bullets. Land exhaustion in the older tobacco states, where the soil was mined rather than cultivated, likewise drove people westward. Glib-tongued speculators, accepting small down payments, made easier the purchase of new holdings. The western boom was stimulated by additional developments. Acute distress during the embargo years turned many saddened faces toward the setting sun. The crushing of the Indians in northwest and south by Generals Harrison and Jackson pacified the frontier and opened up vast virgin tracts of land. The building of highways improved the land routes to the Ohio Valley. Noteworthy was the Cumberland Road, begun in 1811 which ran entirely from western Maryland to Illinois. The use of the first steamboat on western waters, also in 1811, heralded a new era of upstream navigation. But the West, despite the inflow of settlers, was still weak in population and influence. Not potent enough politically to make its its voice heard, It was forced to ally itself with other sections. Thus strengthened, it demanded cheap acreage and partially achieved its goal in the Land Act of 1820. It demanded cheap transportation and slowly got it, despite the constitutional qualms of the presidents and the hostility of Easterners. Finally, the West demanded cheap money, issued by its own banks and fought the powerful bank of the United States to attain its goal. Sectional tensions were nakedly revealed in 1819, when the territory of Missouri 
knocked on the doors of Congress for admission as a slave state. This fertile and well-watered area contained sufficient population to warrant statehood. But the House of Representatives threw a monkey wrench into the plans of the Missourians by passing the incendiary Talmadge Amendment. It stipulated that no more slaves should be brought into Missouri, and also provided for the gradual emancipation of children born to slave parents already there. A mounting roar of anger burst from slaveholding Southerners. They were joined by many Depression-cursed pioneers who favored unhampered expansion of the West, and by many Northerners, especially die-hard Federalists, who were eager to use the issue to break the back of the Virginia dynasty, the various different presidents from Virginia. Southerners saw the Talmadge Amendment, which was defeated in the Senate, as an ominous threat to the sectional balance. When the Constitution was adopted in 1788, the North and South were running neck and neck in wealth and population. But with every passing decade, the North was becoming wealthier and also more thickly settled, an advantage reflected in an increasing Northern majority. In the House of Representatives. Yet in the Senate, with 11 states free and 11 slave states, the Southerners had maintained equality. They were therefore in a good position to thwart any Northern effort to interfere with the expansion of slavery, and they didn't want to lose their veto. The future of the slave system caused Southerners profound concern. Missouri was the first state entirely west of the Mississippi River to be carved out of the Louisiana Purchase, and the Missouri Emancipation Amendment might set a damaging precedent for all the rest of the area. Even more disquieting was another possibility. If Congress could abolish slavery in Missouri, might it not attempt to do likewise in the older states of the South? The wounds of the Constitutional Convention of 1787 were once more ripped open. Burning moral questions also protruded, even though the main issue was political and economic balance. A small but growing group of anti-slavery agitators in the North seized the occasion to raise an outcry against the evils of slavery. They were determined that the plague of human bondage should not spread further into the virgin territories. Deadlock in Washington was at length broken in 1820 by the time-honored American solution of compromise, actually a bundle of three compromises. Henry Clay of Kentucky will play a leading role in this. Congress, despite abolitionist pleas, agreed to admit Missouri as a slave state. But at the same time, Free Soil Maine, which until then had been a part of Massachusetts, was admitted as a separate state. The balance between North and South was thus kept at twelve states each, and remained there for another fifteen years. Although Missouri was permitted to retain slaves, all future bondage was prohibited in the remainder of the Louisiana Purchase, north of the line of 3630, the southern boundary of Missouri. This horse-trading adjustment was politically even-handed, though denounced by extremists on each side as a dirty bargain. Both North and South yielded something. Both gained something. The South won the prize of Missouri as an unrestricted slave state. The North won the concession that Congress could forbid slavery in the remaining territories. More gratifyingly to many Northerners was the fact that the immense area north of 3630 except Missouri, 
was forever closed to slavery. Yet the restriction on future slavery in the territories was not unduly offensive to the slave owners, partly because the northern prairie land did not seem adapted to slave labor. Even so, a majority of southern congressmen voted against the compromise. Neither North nor South was actually displeased, although neither was completely happy. But that's the way democracy works. Fortunately, the Missouri Compromise lasted 34 years, a vital formative period in the life of the young Republican, uh, Republic. And during that time, it preserved the shaky compact of the states. Yet the embittered dispute over slavery heralded the future breakup of the Union. Ever after, the morality of the South's so-called peculiar institution was an issue that could not be swept under the rug. The Missouri Compromise only ducked the question. It didn't resolve it. The Missouri dispute proved to be another serious setback to nationalism and a tremendous stimulus to sectionalism. From this time forward, the embattled South began to develop a nationalism of its own, a kind of sectional nationalism. Needing sectional reinforcements, it cast flirtatious eyes upon the adolescent West, which in turn was seeking allies. Hotheads in both the North and the South, numbering only a tiny minority, clamored for secession or a shooting showdown in 1820. But fortunately for the Union, hostilities were postponed. With every passing decade, the North was becoming stronger in population, wealth, industry, and transportation, all of which added up to military strength. Admittedly, the Missouri solution was a compromise, a partial surrender on both sides. Subsequent generations have tended to sneer at Henry Clay and the other architects of the settlement as weak appeasers. Yet the fact should not be overlooked that compromise and statesmanship are often Siamese twins. In free and peaceful association of sovereign states, no group of them could lord it over the others. That is, if they were all going to live together under the same roof. Without compromise, there could have been no constitution in 1787. Compromise made the Union in 1789. Compromise saved the Union until 1860. When the compromise broke down, the Union broke up. The Missouri Compromise and the concurrent panic of 1819 should have dimmed the political star of President Monroe. Certainly, both unhappy events had a dampening effect on the era of good feelings. But smooth-spoken James Monroe was so popular and the Federalists' opposition so weak that in the presidential election of 1820 he received every electoral vote except one. Unanimity was an honor reserved only for George Washington. Monroe, as it turned out, was the only president in American history to be re-elected after a term in which a major financial panic began. Nationalism of this time, despite setbacks, was further reflected and strengthened by the Supreme Court. The August Tribunal was dominated by the tall, thin, and aggressive Chief Justice John Marshall. A deathbed Federalist appointee of John Adams' aspiring uh, administration, he had served at Valley Forge during the Revolution, and while suffering from cold and hunger, had been painfully impressed with the drawbacks of a feeble central authority. Before Marshall mounted the Supreme Bench in 1801, the judiciary had been the weakest and most timid 
of the three arms of the federal government. But he boldly asserted the doctrine of judicial review of congressional legislation in the case of Marbury v. Madison in 1803. And long before the end of his 34 years of service, he had made the judiciary, in some respects, the strongest branch of the national government. Marshall, whose formal legal schooling had lasted only six weeks, was a judicial statesman rather than a strictly impartial judge. He examined a case through the colored lenses of his Federalist philosophy, and then undertook to find legal precedents to support his preconceptions. Sure of his ground, he wrote some of his most important decisions, even before the lawyers had concluded their arguments. In the vain hope of offsetting Marshall's federalism, President Jefferson and his successors appointed Republicans to the Supreme Court. But by this time, many Republicans had come to accept the Federalist ideal of a strong central government. And Marshall found it easy to lead his colleagues the rest of the way. The Jeffersonians raged, while Jefferson himself privately condemned them. But Marshall pushed ahead inflexibly on his Federalist course, though bending slightly in his final years. For over three decades, the ghost of Alexander Hamilton spoke through the lanky, black-robed judge, as a shaper of the Constitution in the direction of a more potent central government. Marshall ranks as the foremost of the molding fathers. As a wealthy businessman and land speculator, he instinctively shared Hamilton's preference for the propertied class. As a Virginia aristocrat, he deplored democratic excesses and opposed uh, universal male suffrage and the rule of the unwashed masses. One group of Marshall's decisions, perhaps the most famous, resulted in bolstering the power of the federal government at the expense of the states. A notable case in this category was McCulloch v. Maryland. The suit involved an attempt by the state of Maryland to destroy a branch of the Bank of the United States by imposing a tax on its notes. John Marshall, speaking for the court, declared the bank constitutional by invoking the Hamiltonian doctrine of implied powers. At the same time, he strengthened federal authority and slapped at state infringements when he denied the right of Maryland to tax the bank. With ringing emphasis, he affirmed that the power to tax involves the power to destroy, and that the power to create implies a power to preserve. Marshall's ruling, in this case, gave the doctrine of loose constructionism its most famous formulation. The Constitution, he said, derived from the consent of the people, and thus permitted the government to act for their benefit. He further argued that the Constitution was intended to endure for ages to come, and consequently, to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs. Two years later, the case of Cohen's versus Virginia gave Marshall one of his greatest opportunities. The Cohen's, found guilty by the Virginia courts of illegally selling lottery tickets, appealed to the highest tribunal. Virginia won in that the conviction of the Cohens was upheld, but it lost in that Marshall resoundingly asserted the right of the Supreme Court to review the decisions of the state Supreme Courts in all questions involving powers of the federal government. The state's rights people were aghast.
hardly less significant in Marshall's career was the celebrated steamboat case, Gibbons versus Ogden. The suit grew out of an attempt by the state of New York to grant to a private concern a monopoly of waterborne commerce between New York and New Jersey. Marshall sternly reminded the upstart state that the Constitution conferred on Congress alone the control of interstate commerce. He thus struck another blow at states' rights while upholding the sovereign powers of the federal government. Interstate streams were thus cleared of this judicial snag, while the departed spirit of Hamilton may have applauded. Marshall's decisions are felt even today. In this sense, his nationalism was the most tenaciously enduring of the era. He buttressed the Federal Union and helped to create a stable, nationally uniform environment for business. At the same time, Marshall checked the excesses of popularly elected state legislatures. In an age when white male suffrage was flowering and America was veering toward stronger popular control, Marshall almost single-handedly shaped the Constitution along conservative, centralizing lines that ran somewhat counter to the dominant spirit of the new century. Through him, the conservative Hamiltonians triumphed from the tomb. The yeasty nationalism of the years after the War of 1812 was likewise reflected in the shaping of foreign policy. To this end, the nationalistic President Monroe teamed with his nationalistic Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, the cold and scholarly son of the frosty and bookish ex-president. The younger Adams, a statesman of the first rank, happily rose above the ingrown Federalist sectionalism of his native New England and proved to be one of the great secretaries of state. To its credit, the Monroe administration negotiated the much underrated Treaty of 1818 with England. It permitted Americans to share the coveted Newfoundland fisheries with their Canadian cousins. This multi-sided agreement also fixed the vague northern limits of Louisiana along the 49th parallel from the Lake of the Woods to the Rocky Mountains. The treaty further provided for a ten-year joint occupation of the untamed Oregon country, without a surrender of the rights or claims of either America or Britain. To the south lay semi-tropical Spanish Florida, which many Americans believed geographic, geographically and uh, Providence had destined for it to become a part of the United States. Americans already claimed West Florida, where uninvited American settlers had torn down the hated Spanish flag in 1810. Congress ratified this grab in 1812, and during the War of 1812 against Spain's ally Britain, a small American army seized the Mobile region, but the bulk of Florida remained tantalizingly under Spanish rule. When an epidemic of revolutions broke out in South America, notably in Argentina in 1816, Venezuela in 1817, and Chile in 1818, Spain was forced to denude Florida of troops to fight the rebels. A chaotic situation rapidly developed in the swampy peninsula. Bands of Indians, runaway slaves, and white outcasts poured across the border into American territory, burning and scalping, and then fled to safety behind the surveyor's line. General Andrew Jackson, idol of the West and scourge of the Indians, reappeared in 1817. The Monroe administration formally commissioned him to punish the Indians, and, if necessary, to pursue them into Florida. 
but he was to respect all posts under the Spanish flag. Early in 1818, Jackson swept across the Florida border with all the fury of an avenging angel. He hanged two Indian chiefs without ceremony, and after hasty military trials, executed two British subjects for assisting the Indians. He also seized the two most important Spanish ports in the area, St. Mark's and then Pensacola, where he deposed the Spanish governor, who was lucky enough to escape Jackson's hanging noose. Jackson had clearly exceeded his instructions from Washington. Alarmed, President Monroe consulted his cabinet. Its members were for disavowing or disciplining Jackson. All except the lone wolf John Quincy Adams refused to howl with the pack. An ardent patriot and nationalist, the flinty New Englander, finally won the others over to his point of view. Far from apologizing, he took the offensive and emphatically informed Spain that it had violated the Spanish-American Treaty of 1795 by not suppressing the outlaws of Florida. He then insisted that the alternatives were for the Spaniards to control the area, a task that they admitted was impossible, or cede it to the United States, a course that was galling to their pride. Distressed in Latin America and at home, and believing that they were going to lose Spanish Florida in either case, the Spanish decided to dispose of the alligator-infested area while they could still get something for it. In the mislabeled Florida Purchase Treaty of 1819, Spain ceded Florida, as well as shadowy Spanish claims to Oregon, in exchange for America's abandonment of equally shadowy claims to Texas, soon to become part of independent Mexico. The hitherto vague western boundary of Louisiana was made to run zigzag along the Rockies to the 42nd parallel and to then turn due west to the Pacific, dividing Oregon from Spanish holding. After the Napoleonic nightmare, the rethroned autocrats of Europe banded together in a kind of monarchical protective association. Determined to restore the good old days, they undertook to stamp out the democratic tendencies that had sprouted from soil richly fertilized by the ideals of the French Revolution. The world must be made safe from democracy, they believed. The crown despots acted promptly. <clears throat> With complete ruthlessness, they smothered the embers of rebellion in Italy in 1821 and in Spain in 1823. According to the European rumor factory, they were also gazing across the Atlantic. Russia, Austria, Prussia, and France, acting in partnership, would presumably send powerful fleets and armies to the uh, former colonies of Spanish America and therefore restore the Spanish king to his ancestral domains. Many Americans were alarmed. Sympathetic to democratic revolutions everywhere, they had cheered when the Latin American republics rose from the ruins of monarchy. Americans feared that if the European powers intervened in the New World, the cause of republicanism would suffer irreparable harm. The physical security of the United States, the motherlode of democracy, would be endangered by the proximity of powerful and unfriendly forces. The southward push of the Russian bear from the chill region now known as Alaska had already publicized the menace of monarchy to North America. 
In 1821, the Tsar of Russia issued a decree extending Russian jurisdiction over a hundred miles uh, down to the line of 51, an area that embraced most of the coast of present-day British Columbia. The energetic Russians had already established trading posts almost as far south as the entrance to uh, San Francisco Bay, and the fear prevailed in the United States that they were planning to cut the Republic off from California, its prospective window on the Pacific. Great Britain, still mistress of the seas, was now beginning to play a lone hand role of the on the complicated international stage. In particular, it recoiled from joining hands with the continental European powers in crushing the newly won liberties of the Spanish-American nations. These revolutionists had thrown open their monopoly-bound ports to outside trade, and British shippers, as well as Americans, both of whom had found the profits to be sweet. Accordingly, in August of 1823, George Canning, the haughty British Foreign Secretary, approached the American M uh, minister in London with a startling proposition. Would not the United States combine with Britain in a joint declaration, renouncing any interest in acquiring Latin American territory, and specifically warning the European despots to keep their harsh hands off the Latin American republics. The American minister, lacking instructions, referred this scheme to his superiors in Washington. Reactions in America to the Canning proposal varied. The intimate advisers of President Monroe, including the aged Jefferson and Madison, recommended that the Republic lock arms with a hitherto distrusted mother country. The one notable exception was again the lone wolf nationalist, Secretary Adams, who was hard-headed enough to beware of Britain's bearing gifts. Why should the lordly British, with the mightiest navy afloat, need America as an ally, an America that had neither naval nor military strength. Such a union, argued Adams, was undignified. Adams, ever alert, thought that he detected the joker in the Canning proposal. The British feared that the aggressive Yankees would one day seize Spanish territory in the Americas, perhaps Cuba, which would jeopardize England's possessions in the Caribbean. If Canning could seduce the United States into joining with him in support of the territorial integrity of the New World, America's own hands would be morally tied. A self-denying alliance with Britain would not only hamper American expansion, concluded Adams, but was unnecessary. He suspected, correctly, that the European powers had not agreed upon any definite plans for invading the Americas. In any event, the British Navy would not permit hostile fleets to come, because the South American markets had to be kept open at all costs for English merchants. It was presumably safe for Uncle Sam, behind the protective wooden petticoats of the British Navy, to blow a defiant nationalistic blast at all of Europe. The distresses of the old world again set the stage for another American diplomatic coup. The Monroe Doctrine was born late in 1823, when the nationalistic Adams won the nationalistic Monroe over to his way of thinking. The President, in his regular annual message to Congress on December 2, 1823, incorporated a stern warning to the European powers. Its two basic features were, one, non-colonization, and two, non-intervention. Monroe first directed his verbal blast primarily at the lumbering Russian bear in the Northwest, 
With emphatic tones he proclaimed in effect that the era of colonization in the Americas had ended, and that henceforth there would be a permanently closed season. What the great powers had, they might keep. But neither they nor any other world powers could seize or otherwise acquire more. This lofty declaration was later resented by those nations, notably Germany and Italy, that were not unified and hence unable to take out colonial hunting licenses until late in the century. At the same time, Monroe sounded a trumpet blast against foreign intervention. He was clearly concerned with regions to the south, where fears were felt for the newly fledged Spanish-American republics. Monroe bluntly warned the crowned heads of Europe to keep their hated monarchical systems out of this hemisphere. For its part, the United States would not intervene in the war with the Greeks uh, when they were fighting against the Turks for their independence. Monroe's ringing declaration quickened the patriotic pulse of nationalistic young America. The American people were thrilled, even though they had no effective army or navy, to shake their collective fists at all the European despots and loudly warn them to stay away. While gratifying national pride and striking a blow for democratic rule, Monroe was also striking a blow for the almighty dollar as represented by the freshly opened Latin American markets. Reactions in England were mixed. The British press, likewise savoring the juicy Latin American markets, was generally favorable to Monroe's forceful warning. But Canning was irked, for he perceived that the Monroe Doctrine was aimed at possible land-grabbing by Britain, as well as by Europe. Hands off applied to all outside powers, including Britain. The monarchs of Europe were angered. Having resented the incendiary American experiment from the beginning, they were now deeply offended by Monroe's high-flown pronouncement. All the more so because the gulf between America's loud pretensions and her weak military strength but though offended by the upstart Yankees, the European powers found their hands tied, and their frustration increased their annoyance. Even if they had worked out plans for invading the Americas, they would have been helpless before the booming broadsides of the British Navy. Monroe's solemn warning when issued made little splash in the newly hatched republics to the south. Anyone could see that the United States was only really concerned about its neighbors because it was primarily concerned about defending itself against future invasion. Only a relatively few educated Latin Americans knew of the message, and they generally recognized that the British Navy, not the paper military of James Monroe, stood between them and a hostile Europe. In truth, Monroe's message did not have much contemporary significance. Americans applauded it and then forgot it, as they had turned back to such activities as felling trees and fighting Indians. Not until 1845 did President Polk revive it, and not until mid-century did it become an important national dogma. The new doctrine was not even necessary in a narrow sense. Secretary Adams, in firm diplomatic notes, had already warned Russia against trespassing on the northwest coast. Even before Monroe's stiff message, the Tsar had decided to retreat. This he formally did in the Russian-American Treaty of 1824, which fixed his southernmost limits at the line of 5440. The present southern tip at that time of the Alaska Panhandle. Monroe Doctrine might 
accurately have been called the self-defense doctrine. President Monroe was concerned basically with the security of his own country, as he should be as president of that country, and not as much about the Latin American countries. All right, well, with that, we will end this lecture. And I believe that that will be the last lecture for that will be needed for the third lecture test. Thank you.